Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday Gospel webinar. It's Sister Yesant here, and uh, it's uh, a great joy to welcome you all. Uh, tonight is going to be a bit different because, of course, uh, this week is Holy Week, which is why I think there's not so many of you because uh, there must be things happening in your parishes or things like that. I don't know. Tomorrow is Holy Thursday, so we're getting ready for the celebration of the liturgy and lots of people uh, are making the most of uh, uh, the uh, easing of restrictions as well. So, But it's wonderful to be together and what I propose to do tonight rather than our usual uh, well, we'll start with the Sunday Gospel. We'll begin looking at the Sunday Gospel, which is going to be Easter Sunday Gospel. Uh, but then we'll we'll sort of revisit the three days that are just upon us, starting tomorrow, Monday, Thursday, uh, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday, or rather the Easter Vigil. We'll, we'll look at all that uh, a little bit. I'm just going to make a, a, a short commentary about all of this and uh and hopefully that will um uh, that will help you uh to uh enter into the liturgy of the church which is just the, the highlight of the whole year this week the most amazing participation in the lord's passion death and resurrection which is open to all of us so it's it's a great joy to have you all welcome to if anyone hasn't been with us before it's very easy uh i'm just going to talk but you can use the chat box as much as you want to comment and and ask questions or disagree or ask clarifications sister lucy is with us on the uh uh um chat box yes our, our wi-fi is so much better we've we've had some works done and so we've we sort of separated the wi-fi from the chapel to the house which means that uh, we have um more of it i guess if you can quantify these things and so uh, it's going to be hopefully better for you all it's only better for us and we give thanks <laughs> uh, because it, it, it's always been a headache our wi-fi being in the middle of the new forest um it's a bit of a challenge because there's most more pe more ponies than people around us and and so it's hard to get cables and things like that so there we go wonderful to have you all lovely to see you uh, well i can't see you you can see me but uh Anne and trisha and mayan and james welcome it's great to have you uh tonight and uh, yes, the, the live stream is on uh, in the chapel as well. So it should be better as well, hopefully. And uh, so there we go. It should be less um, iffy. There we go. So let's begin. Um, and as ever, we're, we're going to start with prayer, turning to the Lord in prayer, uh, asking his help, asking for the Holy Spirit to be with us tonight as we ponder the gospel so let's begin together and again please don't hesitate to use the chat box as much as you want it's for you and sister lucy is on it so she will be able to help you right so let's pray in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. It was very early on the first day of the week and still dark when Mary of Magdala came to the tomb. She saw that the stone had been moved away from the tomb and came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. 
They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, she said, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter set out with the other disciple to go to the tomb. They ran together, but the other disciple, running faster than Peter, reached the tomb first. He bent down and saw the linen cloths lying on the ground, but did not go in. Simon Peter, who was following now, came up, went right into the tomb, saw the linen cloths on the ground, and also the cloth that had been over his head. This was not with the linen, linen cloths, but rolled up in the place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and he believed. Till this moment they had failed to understand the teaching of scripture that he must rise from the dead. Now this is the gospel that is given really in all three years ABC uh, as the gospel of the Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, the empty tomb from John 20, the first lines in the chapter 20 of St. John. And they follow on immediately those lines. It was very early on the first day of the week and still dark. This is the next, the line after the last line that we are going to hear on Good Friday, which is the line of uh, the, the last uh, sentences in chapter 19, where Jesus is laid in the tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. So this is the follow up on the passion which we will hear on Good Friday. And so this evening I want to look both at the passion and this reading, but we're going to begin actually earlier than that, we're going to begin on Monday, Thursday, because really the tridium is one event. It's very important to understand it and experience it as one event. So there's, the tridium means the three days, the three days of Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And Saturday, the Easter Vigil, so Sunday morning is the morning of the resurrection. So Thursday evening, we begin with Monday, Thursday, and, and we begin that mass as every mass. It's actually it's the mass of all masses because it's the, the mass of the institution of the Last Supper the mass of the institution of the priesthood, the mass which is the first mass ever celebrated, the mass celebrated by Jesus himself, the mass of the Passover of the Lord. Uh, so this is on tomorrow evening and we're going to be invited to participate. And this is the beginning of the passion of Jesus, uh, the institution of the, of the Eucharist. This man, Mass begins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, as every other Mass, but it doesn't end with a final blessing because at the end we go off uh, in procession with the Blessed Sacrament to the altar of repose. So we literally follow Jesus in real time um, and, and we're going to be with the Lord in the garden like like it was in Gethsemane. We're going to be those disciples he takes with him and we're going to watch with him. Uh, so there's no final blessing, there's no official closing to the Mass on Monday, Thursday. And neither does Good Friday begin with the sign of the cross. Good Friday, the celebration of the Passion, begins when the priest prostrates in front of the altar in silence for quite a moment, quite a long time. And then immediately he uh, he opens up the celebration, as it were, with, with a prayer, but not with a greeting, with the, the usual introductory rite. It's not a mass, so there's no penitential rite. There's no in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He just gets up and prays. And then there is no mass till the Easter Vigil. And the Easter Vigil doesn't begin with the sign of the cross. Oh, I forgot to say, at Good Friday, uh, 
Good Friday neither does the celebration of the Passion end with a final blessing. So we still haven't had a final blessing. Uh, the celebration of the Passion of the Lord ends with a final prayer and then a, a sending, a sort of a sending off, but after communion. But that's it. It's, no, it's not a mass again. There's no final blessing. There's no sign of the cross at the end. Then uh, Easter Saturday, Easter Vigil, we begin with the fire. So we begin with the fire, with the blessing of the fire. It's not the proper introductory rites again. And, and it's only at the end of the Easter Vigil that we have the final blessing. So those events form one ceremony from the introductory rites that we have on Holy Thursday to the final blessing that we have at the end of the Easter Vigil. And, and the, the Easter Sunday Mass is, is as it were, a repeat um, of the Easter Vigil, but not as good, really, because Easter Vigil is really the, the top. It's, it's the, it's the summit of the whole liturgy. Now, this, uh, don't take me uh, at my word, I'm not a liturgical expert here. I'm just trying to encourage you to really experience those three days as one event. We're not letting go of Jesus. We're following him all through. And, and a wonderful way to experience the, the, the three days of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus is to really take those days as it were off, to, to in between ceremonies and services, to, to stay with the Lord, to remain, to ponder what would Jesus have been through at that moment on, you know, during the night on Thursday, during the morning of Good Friday, being interrogated, being tossed from one place to another, from Pilate to, to the high priest, to Herod and back again, um, what well, to be with Jesus, to remain with Jesus, and then to experience after the death of Jesus, which we celebrate during the celebration of the Passion on Good Friday, so at three o'clock, to uh, uh, once Jesus is in the tomb, to, to as it were stay with him and spend the stay of the evening of Good Friday and Holy Saturday as much as possible in silence to be with the Lord in the silence of his death uh, and, and pondering this mystery of the Lord dying and descending into Sheol, the place where he goes and frees, proclaims the good news to those who had been uh, waiting for him, all those who had died before he came and who also are called to salvation called to faith in him, called to respond to him. So that's the people he goes and seek in the realm of the dead on Holy Saturday. And, but all that is happening in great silence until the burst of joy, the wonder of the Easter Vigil on Holy Saturday in the evening at night after sunset, where we meet in the darkness until the light comes the light of the Paschal candle, the light of the resurrection. So that's what really the church invites us to do, to live this event as one ceremony and, and in between to try to remain recollected with Jesus and the disciple. Now, what I propose to do tonight uh, very quickly um, and sort of slightly clumsily, but is to keep track of the body of the Lord. Uh, why? Because, because the, the gospel of Sunday is the gospel of the empty tomb. It's the gospel where we lost him. He's not there. He should be there. He's not there. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, says Mary Magdalene. And unlike the other synoptic gospels, which uh, present us with some encounters at this point, well, John, the encounter will come immediately after that. The encounter of Mary Mag Mag of Magdala and Jesus, uh, Mary of Magdala, who is the one who will stay at the tomb, and the other two will go off. Well, she was right to stay because then she meets Jesus. But that comes just after. But in this passage that we're given on Sunday, there is no angel. There are no angels. There is no Jesus. There is nothing but the empty tomb, 
and the cloths lying on the ground and, and sort of tidied up. Now, this empty tomb, um, you know, it could have been tomb robbers, people who come in to, to steal what's in the tomb. And we know that when Jesus was laid in the tomb just before in the Gospel of St. John, he was laid, he was wrapped in those linen cloths, but also with, with very, very costly um, spices which Nicodemus had bought. So those costly spices uh, would have been um, a motive for robbery in the tomb. But the, the thing is usually the, the tomb robbers would take the stuff and leave the body. And here the stuff is there, but the body is not there. So it's obviously not tomb robbers. And also they don't fold up and tidy up and roll up the, the cloths when they've been inside, which is what the case is. And so perhaps when we see mention of the other disciple who goes and, and, and sees all this scene and believes, maybe it's because he has reached the conclusion, well, there is no other explanation for this but the resurrection. Because if anyone else had been in the tomb, it wouldn't look like that. They would have taken him and the cloths around his body. They wouldn't have taken a naked body. Or they would have taken the stuff and left him behind. But um, all of this are clues, if you want. However, it's very important to remember that the empty tomb is not a proof of the resurrection because there could be other explanations, but it's a sign. And, and especially in the Gospel of St. John here, it's a very, very strong sign, a sign that prompts to faith, as we see with the other disciple who sees and believes. It's a sign for our faith as well, that the tomb is still empty. We still haven't found the body of Jesus. There is no other explanation perhaps than his resurrection it's a sign but his tomb being empty is also a promise that our tomb will be empty if we remain in him who alone has come through death so where uh, He's that body of Jesus. And that's why we're going to track the body of Jesus from Holy Thursday to, uh, to, to Easter Sunday. See what happens to it. Now, on Monday, Thursday, we have the institution of the Eucharist. Now, this is not from the Gospel. It's from St. Paul, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. And this is the text that we're going to hear during the first reading tomorrow evening at the Mass of the Last Supper. And because the Gospel will be the washing of the feet. And both the institution of the Eucharist and the washing of the feet tell us something about Jesus, of course, but tell us something about the priesthood as well. But here is St. Paul. Now I've color-coded bits and pieces and you will see that it will come handy. Uh, all, all the red is about what happens to Jesus in his physicality, his body, his blood. So what happens to Jesus physically? The purple will be something um, which I will mention a, a slightly later and it will make sense then. But what I want to focus on is the institution of the Eucharist is the beginning of the passion. And we begin the passion with a deliberate act of Jesus, his choice. And that gives a dynamic to everything else. Uh, on the night Jesus was betrayed, is this inevitable? Is this Jesus being a complete victim of circumstances and being helpless. Not quite. Of course, he is victim because all this is done to him. He's bet betrayed. 
but it is also and fundamentally a choice of him to hand himself over to be delivered and in fact delivered and betrayed is the same word uh, in greek the same root word which we will look at but so what jesus does is what he chooses to do is to inform us and not only inform us but actually act at the beginning of his passion so that there can be no doubt that what is happening is not outside of his will and in fact it's his choice now, this is very difficult to understand to some extent because neither is it suicide what is done to him is done by us is done by sin by sinners but he accepts that he chooses that to be done to him and we see his sovereign choice in the institution of the eucharist because his body is not taken from himself or from us from the world from life his body is given by him he is fully in possession of himself much more so than we are because he's both god and man and every event every circumstances is within his power to change but this is his choice this is my body which is for you this is the cup in the new covenant in my blood now the word covenant is also the word for testament that word covenant implies that um, and it's especially in in the scripture the covenant is usually the choice of god it comes the initiative of god it comes from him it's in his terms he's the one who set it up is the one who fulfills it there is reciprocity of course he demands something of us in exchange but we are never the ones to initiate it is always the one to do it and the blood the covenant in my blood means that god has the initiative here it's his choice but not only in jesus not only god alone but the whole of the humanity of jesus um, sort of submits chooses what god wants and we see that in gethsemane just after this episode of the institution of the last supper where jesus asks prays for the father's will to be done and not his so the whole of his humanity the whole of his human freedom his human will his human love his human choice is aligned to the will of the father what then is happening to him from that moment from the moment of his betrayal and handing over to the to the high priest and then to the romans is his choice absolutely it's not something that he's helpless against and this is comes prominently throughout the all the passions in all the gospels but especially in john that he is sovereign and this is exactly what we're going to look at in the passion now I, I by way of scripture here is the two chapters that we're going to hear on good friday the passions according to saint john i have color coded them again uh, and it's just this is again a, a, a sort of a meditation in order to prepare ourselves to experience good friday so john chapter 18 and chapter 19 what i've put in red is what happens to him physically again his body this is what you know tra tracking his body tracing what happens to him what is in blue are his words and and we can see that there is a, a sort of a a gap as it were um, between his body and his words what happens to him physically and what he says and yet there is one single will because what he says expresses always his sovereignty his choice his absolute control and in fact he's the one who's asking question he's the one who chooses to remain silent or not he's the one who he seems to be completely in charge 
So, for example, knowing all that was to befall him, he knows everything and he goes for it. Uh, he's not saying, oh, maybe there's a chance that I will uh, be spared my life or I will turn around this situation. No, he knows exactly. And he goes for it. And yet he could have avoided it all. Uh, in fact, we see his power when in St. John's Gospel again, when he says, whom do you speak, seek? They answered Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he, which is the word for, for God, the name of God. I am. Um, he, they drew back and fell to the ground. This is how powerful his words are. Uh, so he, he keeps asking them questions. So now, normally, when someone is arrested, uh, it's it's the people, the armed people, the, the stronger people who ask the questions, not the one who is going to be arrested. And then he tells them what to do. I told you that I am here. If you seek me, let these men go. So he's completely in charge. He tells them what to do. He tells Peter what to do. Put your sword in its sheath. And then he, he sort of questions the high priest as well. Who is trying to question him? Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me. So he tells him what to do again. Uh, and then again, he, he questions the person who, who strikes him. Uh, and, and this continues on the, the, um, with Pilate, the whole, Pilate the, the whole dialogue with Pilate. Jesus proclaims his own kingship and tells Pilate to his face that he would have no power if it hadn't been given to him from above. So Jesus is king, Jesus is sovereign, Jesus is Lord. And this is all evident in his words. And there is no pretense here that he's anything other than the Lord. But then when we look at the red, again, and even, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna continue with his words, even on the cross, when he's dying, he's organizing matters, as it were. Uh, Woman, behold your son, he said to the disciple, behold your mother. So he's organizing, uh, uh, and then he knows he's in control after this, Jesus knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. So he is fully knowing and fully willing. His capacity, uh, his human choice, his deliberate choice, is absolutely expressed in his words as someone who is giving himself over willingly knowingly but could equally have chosen not to so the supreme freedom of jesus we never have that type of freedom because usually things that happen to us we don't have that much freedom over them but jesus had absolute and supreme freedom even in a situation when he was physically um completely destroyed and not only physically but at every level of his humanity so now let's look in contrast to his words of supreme power and control we have what is done to him and except for the first chapter uh, first few uh, verses in chapter 18 when he goes forth and he comes forward so that he goes to meet his passion. It's not done to him reluctantly. He goes ahead to meet his passion. But then after that, everything is done to him. He allows everything to happen to him. He relinquishes, as it were, his, his physical control. And so he's seized and bound, is led and then he's struck, bound, and again led. He's led from one place to another. He's tossed around again from Pilate to Caiaphas, from Hannas to Caiaphas, from Caiaphas to Pilate. And then he's scourged. He's crowned with thorns and he's mocked and struck. And then he's exposed to the crowds and and condemned 
and then he's brought out to be crucified, bearing his own cross. So that's what happens to him physically. He's crucified. He's uh, disrobed, exposed, stripped. And then he is given vinegar to drink. And even after death, of course, everything is done to him. By then he is dead. So one of the soldiers pierced his side and there came blood and water. Then Joseph of Arimathea takes away the body of Jesus. Nicodemus has bring, brought the myrrh, about a hundred pounds weight, which would have cost an absolute fortune. So that's why, you know, probably so that's a cause to think that maybe there would have been uh, robbers in the tomb, but again, they would have taken it instead of taking the body. But so they took the body of Jesus, bound it in the linen cloths with the spices, and they led Jesus in the tomb. So I've I've summarized it, all these actions that are done to Jesus here. This is everything that happens to him. This is everything that he chooses to happen to him. This is everything that happens once he has given his body. This is my body given for you. This is what we do to him. This is what sin does. This is how life, God who is life, is um, rejected. The powers of sin and death are at work here to destroy Jesus, God the Son. Now one word, again, the, the word that I wanted to look at, the word that we found, the same word which is for delivered and betrayed, and in Latin is tradere, from which we have tradition, handing over. In Greek is paradidomi. And it means betrayed, delivered. And it's also the word that is used in St. John when Jesus gives up his spirit. Jesus says it well, delivers his spirit. Uh, and, and so we have it in, in purple in the text. And you can see that it, it's used constantly. Jesus is betrayed, Jesus is handed over, Jesus is again handed over, handed over, delivered, handed over, and finally he gave up his spirit. Now that word is used in the passions all the time, not just in St. John, but in all the synoptic gospel. In fact, it would be a wonderful Bible study to sort of trace that word everywhere and saint paul uses it as well jesus is delivered by people to people as it were by judas to the priest by the priest to pilate by pilate to herod by that's in the gospel of saint luke i think by herod to pilate by pilate to the jews to be crucified by you know so jesus is tossed around he's handed over but that handing over is the one that he began himself at the institution of the of the Eucharist when he gave his body and poured, you know, this is my body, this is my blood poured out for you. This handing over is initiated by Jesus, who, as the scripture says, has been delivered into the hands of sinful men, into the hands of sinners. So he's the one who initiates him being given over, being delivered into our hands. And that has never finished. That is still going on. And we see the turning around of a delivering of Jesus for evil purpose, this betrayal of Judas, which is the same word, this delivering of one power to another in order to find the best way to destroy him and to destroy him utterly, which we have in the passion, all the passions using that word for this destructive purpose. But now the word is used for a positive, a, a, a life-giving purpose, because Jesus has delivered himself over to humanity, 
to transform humanity, to transform each one of us, to transform the human heart, which nothing else can change. And this is really the solution, as it were, of, of evil. Because from a delivering that is destructive, an utter rejection of God, a, a power to uh, direct it towards death, Jesus transforms this through his passion, being delivered to us for life. And when in the liturgy we celebrate the handing over of Jesus' own body and blood in the Eucharist, the handing over of the word of God, which we hear from, from the church, but which you know is the word of God. It is delivered to us, as it were, to our ears. The message has been delivered. The message of salvation has been handed on. St. Paul uses that word as well, the tradition of the church, the tradition of, of the gospel, as it were, the tradition of the good news has been passed on. This is a handing over of the Lord, who his truth and grace that have been brought through him into the world for salvation. And it's the same Jesus, it's the same Lord that we receive in word and sacrament that is delivered to us, that was delivered at the Passion. So this tradition, this handing over from one person to another, from one age and century to another from you know in in space and time unceasing unbroken tradition carries on and this is what we receive in the liturgy the liturgy is really the place where we see and receive tradition where we see and receive the lord in fact that message which is inseparable from that reality that experience of the presence and salvation of the Lord in the sacraments. So all that, and that's why at the heart of it is the mystery of, of the priesthood. Those men who, as it were, deliver themselves to the service of the Lord are given over to that service and, and, and that service, which is the washing of the feet, which is being instruments of tradition, enabling tradition to carry on so that it can reach every single person uh, in the world. So that's, that tradition begins on Holy Thursday, is seen in all its uh, destructive reality on Good Friday, but that destructive reality is turned into the, the wonderful and in you know definitive victory of life over death on easter sunday on the on the easter vigil the the mystery of the resurrection and so that body that was handed over to be destroyed and to be sealed in the tomb forever never to be handed over again is not in the tomb that body is not in the tomb that body is now risen. So where is Jesus? How is he now handed over? So we come back to the, to the tomb where Jesus was laid, uh, which is something we are going to hear on, on Good Friday. We're going to be left with Jesus laid in the tomb, this great silence. And then on Sunday morning, we will hear that the tomb is empty. And that sign is unexplained. Now, Jesus, who could have avoided every single horrifying torture of the passion, Jesus, who, who could have chosen not to undergo all of this horror, um, something that we can't choose when we are in the middle of tragedy, when we are in the middle of horrif horrible things, we are usually completely helpless. And Jesus, as I said in the beginning, was utterly and absolutely free. He could have avoided it all. But the one thing that he avoided, which we can never avoid ourselves, 
is to stay in the tomb. We can avoid every possible suffering. We can try as much as we can to avoid suffering uh, by escape, you know, entertainment, pleasure, by trying to get enough money uh, to, to sort of avoid all discomfort and, and, and sort of, uh, you know, physical um, hardship. We can try to surround ourselves with the best healthcare, the best of everything, so that we suffer as little as possible. We can try to avoid these things. Although we, if we think that we can avoid suffering, we are fooling ourselves. However, there is one thing we cannot avoid. All of us is to be laid in a tomb and to stay there. Death is inevitable for human persons. If there's anything that we can be absolutely guaranteed that will happen to us, it's death. And that's the thing that Jesus seems to be avoiding by coming out of the tomb. That's the thing that is inevitable to us, that we will stay there. And that's the thing that he defeats. He walks out. And he walks out not to die again, but never to die again. He walks out to a new form of life, to a risen form of life, to a glorious form of life. And he is the only one who has ever done that. And his death is absolutely historical. His resurrection is equally historical. But now, because his resurrection, as it were, transcends time insofar as it's not bound by the dimension of time, he's not getting old, it's also has a cosmic dimension. It's also eternal. It has an eternal value so that it is accessible to all of us. His resurrection is within our reach, even though it happened 2000 years ago. And precisely here is the body of the Lord. The body of the Lord is the one who is made available to us now through the liturgy, through the sacraments of the church. By baptism, we are incorporated into Christ. We, we are members, we are made members of his body and his body is not in the tomb. That's what baptism does. It brings up to this, it brings us into this higher form of life, this divine life of the risen Christ, a life that cannot be defeated by death, a new life that means that whoever is baptized and united to Christ in faith, hope and charity will not remain in the tomb because Christ did not remain in the tomb, that our tomb will be empty provided we are united with him. That's baptism and then every time we celebrate the, the Eucharist, we receive the risen body of Christ, a body that is not in the tomb, a body that is alive in glory for eternity. And we are transformed into his body. So this, this, the Eucharist is the pledge of resurrection for us. Now, it's not a union that is just physical. It's a union it's integral union and it requires the union of our freedom with his freedom the union of our will with his will the union of our knowing with his knowing it needs to be deliberate it needs to be a choice on our part and that's why we cannot be united with him unless we love him unless we want to love him unless we want to love those who belong to his body our brothers and sisters so this union without charity is impossible but it's, it's a, it, the union is, is made real in all its physicality. This is my body. Here he is. He has come out of the tomb. And this is the, the reality that he was telling us about on Holy Thursday that is now made available to all 
times everywhere for everyone that we can be united with him in his resurrection and that's why the joy of the resurrection is not just the joy of wonderful jesus is alive good for him it's the joy of our own resurrection of the of the possibility of life for ourselves the fact that death is defeated in jesus that sin is not the final word that the tomb that is prepared for me is not going to be my eternal resting place that i will rise with him body and soul i will be united with him this is that promise all of that is made possible and is made real through his death and resurrection and is offered to me that same reality is offered to me in the liturgy in the sacraments of the church through baptism and it requires my response of faith hope and charity my union with him so it requires me to receive that reality and to receive it actively not passively and so the empty tomb is a wonderful sign because it requires my response it requires something from me i need to work out all right why is it empty what will i believe what will i choose to believe will i believe oh this is all circumstantial and something must have happened but i don't know what and i'm not going to find out which is often a position we can be tempted to take but quite a lazy position or are we going to think okay the tomb is empty now didn't he say something about that didn't god promised something about that in all the scripture in the old testament didn't jesus himself announce his death yes but also his resurrection to his apostles all through his ministry what will i choose to do will i choose to believe that he has risen with the disciples that he loved and so you know we can imagine ourselves at the tomb of course mary of magdala she shows the best part because she stayed there she she stayed at the tomb afterwards and and i really encourage you to reread those gospels of the resurrection and she's just wonderful but when she she doesn't come she doesn't go here in she just sees that the stone ha, stone has been moved away from the tomb and then she goes and tells simon peter and the other disciple so peter and the other disciple who is likely to be john run to the tomb uh, the other disciple lets peter go in first which is a sign of his primacy even though he was slower because probably he was older uh, and and so peter goes in and and sees the linen cloths on the ground the cloth that has been over his head and then but the tomb is empty the other disciple also goes in he sees and his belief he believes and then it refers to the teaching of scripture so he's not believing just on the evidence of all right there's nothing in the tomb he must be what your reason again they believe because they remember they remember scripture they remember god's promise something quite objective something that can be checked and and now this is a call for us we can put ourselves into the shoes of the disciples we can come into the empty tomb we can see everything all this cloth tidied up no one there what will i choose to do and remembering that the body of the lord which was there is the one that he has given for me and he's not giving me his dead body to be venerated to be honored in the tomb to be wept over in the tomb he's giving me his risen body so that he can unite me in my sinfulness uh, with him 
in 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 all the powers of death that I allow in my life, he can unite me with him so that he can transform me and make of my dead life a new life, a risen life in him. That's my only chance. That's my future. But that will require my faith. And this is why at the Easter Vigil, after all this time of Lent of, of you know, trying to turn back to the Lord, we, we come to the Easter Vigil to receive that new life. This is why we baptize people during the Easter Vigil. This is the feast, the celebration of the new life in God that we all share in. And we share in, we enter into that new life through faith. And that is why the proclamation of our faith at the Easter Vigil is so essential to the whole ceremony because uh, we, we are there to celebrate that new life which we receive now in faith, but we will be uh, receiving in glory forever and ever provided we remain united to the Lord. So I think I finally um, finished talking. You'll be happy to know. Uh, I wonder if uh, anyone has um, anything to say or comment. Welcome, Lisa. So sorry you got the wrong time zone. I yeah, we you've come just at the end. Uh, but uh, you uh, hopefully it's it's all live on Facebook, so you can catch up if you want. Uh, but I hope yes, I hope. Thank you, John. I hope the um, the color coding was uh, useful. Uh, I I find it very useful myself. So <laughs> and now, if you want to uh, download the uh, files that I've been using. There's the, the PowerPoint and there's the, 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 the gospel and there's also the um, um, the, uh, the catechism quotes. You can go to shared files under event board, which is up on the right hand side uh, above the chats and everything. And, and you can see shared files and you can download them if you want to. And also, I wanted to share with you, finally, I still have something to say, amazingly, but uh, it's uh, the uh, catech uh, catechism qu uh, quote to help us re with the Easter Tridium. And it's, quote, uh, it's paragraph 1085. And this is in the Liturgy of the Church. It is principally his own Paschal mystery that Christ signifies and makes present. Now, the Paschal mystery is the whole mystery of the passion, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, actually. So there's a whole giving over, the whole uh, handing over of himself unto death and then into life. So during the, his earthly life, Jesus announced this Paschal mystery by his teaching and anticipated by his action. When his hour comes, he lives out the unique event of history which does not pass away. Jesus dies, is buried, rises from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of the Father once for all. His Paschal mystery is a real event that occurred in our history, but it is unique. All of the historical events happen once, and then they pass away, swallowed up in the past. The Paschal mystery of Christ, by contrast, cannot remain only in the past because by his death, he destroyed the death. And all that Christ is, all that he did and suffered for all men, participates in the divine eternity and so transcends all times while being made present in them all. The event of the cross and resurrection abides and draws everything toward life. And this is what we're going to celebrate. Isn't this exciting? It's wonderful. So I hope you're going to have a wonderful Easter and Tridium, no matter, you know, what difference there is this year, what hardship we still have to endure, to unite whatever it is that we suffer, to unite it all with the passion of the Lord, with the Lord in his passion, with the Lord in his suffering, so that it, be, can, it can be transformed, so that it can be, um, transfigured through the through the through the resurrection. 
So thank you again for coming. And uh, I couldn't see much comments or questions, so I'm going to uh, leave you there. Uh, thank you, Mayan, for your wonderful comment. <laughs> John, I'm not uh, sure that uh, I'm sure you can color code your own scripture notes, can't you? I'm sure there's plenty of time in seminary to do all that. Um, so, and and but I hope this was helpful and uh, uh, to to for us to to celebrate the passion. Uh, you know, in the in the best way. Thank you, Alan. Wonderful. The talk, Lisa. The talk is currently live on Facebook, and it will be on Facebook. So if you have our Facebook page, you will. If you scroll down, you will find it. So there we go. Now let's finish with prayer. Let's turn to Our Lady for a last prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mary, Virgin and Mother. You who moved by the Holy Spirit welcomed the word of life in the depth of your humble faith. As you gave yourself completely to the eternal one, help us to say our own yes to the urgent call as pressing as ever to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Mother of the living gospel, wellspring of happiness for God's little ones, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. God bless you all. Thank you, James. Thank you, Danny. Have a wonderful Easter. And next week is um, Sister Carino, I think. God bless you all. And um, yes, and we're all in communion of prayer throughout Easter. When we celebrate the liturgy, you know, you're all with us. So there we are. We're all in it together. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.